been range bound for a lot of different uh, assets, which which basically points towards not very good real returns over say a five plus year period, uh, but not necessarily expecting a, a crash either. So I've neither been a, kind of a you know melt up bull or a deflationary crash bear. I, I've been more in that range bound camp, uh, which so far has has been working out both in the housing market uh, in aggregate and the, the stock market in aggregate. Uh, obviously, there are very different industries that can be up or down. There are very different geographies that can be up or down. Um, but overall, that's kind of the general path we've been on. Taking off U.S. government obligation is arriving, where it will start making bigger issues. Bridgewater Partners pioneer Beam Doyo said the mutual funds tighten caution during a CNBC appearance that the need to get increasingly more to cover shortages will compound the political and social issues the nation is confronting the U.S. is $33.8 trillion underwater, a complete that detonated by 45% since the coronavirus pandemic in mid-2020, as per depository division information of that all-out $26.7 trillion is owed by the public last year, the public authority rang up a $1.7 trillion deficiency as it. Look to keep up the speed of expenditure as the obligation developed and the central bank raised loan fees to attempt to pack down expansion the public authority burned through $659 billion on net. Revenue costs in monetary 2023. To back the obligation, Doyo said that is a recipe for inconvenience and Lynn Alden concurs with him as per Alden over the long-haul business cycles collect hazards, especially in open obligation the beyond 40 years, have seen increasing obligation with lower loan fees and higher obligation levels comparative with gross domestic product, let us currently get into the video as Lynn Alden plunges further into the dangers in the monetary framework, particularly because of rising public obligation. As you watch, make sure to like, buy in, and drop your remarks beneath. Back historically, I, I kind of classify the long-term debt cycle, um, Ray Dalio's work, for example, and then additional work I put into it to kind of really flesh out and explore this concept. I know you've covered it uh, quite a bit as well. It's basically the observation that um, you go through a number of normal business cycles, but you build up instability in the system uh, a couple different ways, including on the public debt side. And so if we, if we characterize the past 40 years, we had ever rising public debts. So whenever um, we had a recession, we would have, uh, you know, industries get cut uh, that allows uh, higher debt levels and you get, you know, lower lows and lower highs in interest rates and higher highs and higher lows in, in both private sector and public sector debts as a percentage of GDP. And that coincided with basically the, the peace dividend, the, op the opening up of the world. You know, China opened up to the world in the 1980s. Soviet Union fell in the early 90s. And so we, we kind of entered this more connected world for a period of time. And we basically brought Western capital together with Eastern labor and resources. And that was a very kind of productive disinflationary time. Some people were hurt by it, but a lot of people were helped by it. And that, that's kind of been the era we've been in, and that allowed for lower interest rates. And when you look at the government expenditure, if you have higher and higher debt to GDP, but lower and lower interest rates, your overall interest expense remains manageable. Um, and when we had the global financial crisis, a lot of things changed there. We had a bank recapitalization. We hit the peak in terms of private debt relative to GDP. But we push a lot of that debt onto the public sector uh, in multiple countries, especially the United States. And so when we look back at prior long-term debt cycles, they do tend to come in a one-two punch. First, you have the private debt bubble uh, kind of break apart, which is disinflationary. Um, but then the second stage is when all that gets pushed up to the public sector, and then that becomes more of an inflationary type of crisis. Um, so kind of ever since the, the past, call it three, four years, we've been in that second phase of the bubble. Um, and so I think that's one of the best ways to look at it from a historical lens. But then of course you have to think, okay, what is different now in terms of culture, in terms of technology, in terms of just the way the world looks, what you know, what is different, even though that's a useful baseline. And it's, you know, these types of periods are always weird. And so there's going to be challenging things to navigate that you didn't necessarily expect, um, which is why it's useful to have a framework but to also be very flexible with your thinking to see what sort of curveballs might or may not come and then, you know, adjust that over time based on what's happening. 
Alongside the fundamental spending plan issues, Dallow likewise forewarned that unfamiliar purchasers who make up around 40% of interest for U.S. depositories have been easing off spurring a stockpile interest issue information through January demonstrates that unfamiliar possessions of U.S. government. Obligation added up to $7.4 trillion, down $253 billion, or 3.3%. Over the course of the last year, China specifically has cut its property, unequivocally pulling back 177%. During the period, while not foreseeing a significant accident, Alden expects a reachbound market with possibly critical. Vacillations yet not extraordinary genuine returns, she further brings up that the Federal Reserve is generally in a situation to print more cash, so it is difficult for things to quickly go haywire. Let us currently go on with the video as Alden makes sense of further. Back in early 2022, when it became clear that the Fed was going to be quite hawkish, um, uh, that was, you know, my expectation was we'd have a recession by kind of later in the year. Um, and that it'd be tough to get interest rates over 3% before you'd have kind of those types of problems. And for the most of 2022, that was correct. We had s slowing economic indicators. Um, we had two quarters of negative real GDP growth, even though they weren't technically a recession because they didn't have like an unemployment spike and stuff, but we had a period of softness. Asset prices had a pretty bad time across the board. Um, and, but then by early 2023, uh, I started to see signs that it was playing out differently, um, that basically the fiscal deficits, ironically from part of that the monetary tightening, so the higher interest expense from the federal deficits, were starting to actually kind of balance themselves out. They were becoming kind of inflationary and stimulatory. Um, and then when you had the, the kind of the mini banking crisis and the Fed's willingness to re-inject some liquidity in there to stop contagion, these things really kind of added up. Uh, to a, a shift in how I viewed things. So it was, you know, that, that's an example of being flexible where you have a view, it starts playing out, uh, but then after a certain point, it kind of starts being a little different. It's almost like if you're very tired and you stay up all night and you just kind of force yourself through it, eventually you almost get like another burst of being awake again, all right? That, that's, and that's kind of what we saw in markets where they got so tight on the on the fiscal side and the, and the monetary side they we kind of went past the looking glass uh towards actually being somewhat stimulatory because a lot of the private sector debt is low and, and fixed rate especially in the in the household sector and in the investment grade corporate sector so those industries have held up pretty well whereas a lot of the u.s federal debt is short term and so that's been refinanced at at much higher rates and so this the the we have like two very powerful competing forces here. One is that the interest rates are putting downward pressure on a number of interest rate sensitive industries, you know, commercial real estate and small businesses and junk rated companies and the like. But on the other hand, that interest expense is just completely blowing out the deficit, which is uh, on its own. It's a stimulatory inflationary force. And in the past year or so, they've been roughly balanced. In this narrative for several years that they can't create inflation, that, that the markets are too def deflationary for them to do it. And I, I wrote an article back in 2019 where I, I said, are, are bonds in a bubble or is this a new normal? And the conclusion of the article was it is a bubble. Um, and I talked about how I was like, look, a lot of things look disinflationary. Um, but if, if in the next downturn, central banks, uh, you know, they can completely change the rules and they can work with fiscal authorities and just have massive monetized fiscal deficits. It was almost eerie. You know, I didn't talk about a pandemic in that article, but it's almost eerie what happened less than a year after that article came out. It was just completely like, you know, completely the, the rules were changed. Um, and that's what we've seen. And, and the reason I, I had that view is because that's when you get towards a sovereign debt kind of cycle nearing its, its sort of completion. Uh, and a, a completion can take a decade. It doesn't mean a completion like this six months. I mean like this era. Um, right. The rules change. The cycles get tighter. Uh, similarly, during March 2020, I wrote an article called Why This Isn't Like the Great Depression. Uh, and that was like just in the early signs of seeing some of these stimulus. Um, and so my view was, no, no, this is not going to be disinflationary. Uh, this is likely going to be inflationary because the cavalry's response time is quicker and because it's more like the 40s, not like the uh, 30s. So I would, I would consider the 2008 crisis to be very similar to the 1929 crisis. That was at all the hallmarks of a private debt bubble unwinding. Uh, but I think we're past that now. I think now we're towards the sovereign debt bubble. And the closer you get to the sovereign, um, the, the, the quicker the uh, trigger finger is to come in with any sort of thing because it starts to potentially make the treasury market get illiquid.
Customers start off the Christmas season with a bang as a record 20.4 million individuals hit stores and Quest sites for presents from Thanksgiving Day through the online Christmas sales extravaganza. As per a study by the Public Retail League, the turnout denotes an unequaled high since the significant exchange bunch flourish bits of knowledge and examination started following complete in-or and online traffic in 2017 it to last year's figure of 196.7 million customers and the NRS conjecture for around 182 million individuals during the weekend lasting five days the quantity of. Individuals shopping on the web rose to 134.2 kgs generally in accordance with the $325.44 normal last year. The number isn't adapted to expansion. One more early red on vacation spending showed strength in internet-based deals on the biggest shopping day of the year. Purchasers burned through $9.80. Billion in us online deals as per a due up 7.5% from a year prior. The online Christmas sales extravaganza bested that as web-based business spending in the U.S. all out $12.4 billion up year over year, yet it is too early to anticipate how the remainder of the pinnacle retail season might play out strength in early shopping could reflect customers' crave great arrangements, as opposed to their longing to spend it could likewise show an inversion to a pre-pandemic example of. Christmas shopping, when clients focused their spending during busy times like the shopping extravaganza following Thanksgiving deals occasions and the last days before Christmas retailers broadcasted a mindful vibe about the season why revealing profit recently a few organizations including Walmart. Say optional spending stays feeble yet is gotten during special occasions occasion deals in November and December part are supposed to ascend by 3% to 4% year over year to between 97.3 billion and 9,666 billion as per the NRF that is more slow development than during a pandemic yet generally in. Accordance with normal deals increments before coronavirus, do you think forceful buyer spending could impact the central bank's loan cost climb way? Let us in on your viewpoints in the remarks segment beneath. Additionally, remember to like buy-in and turn on warnings gratitude for observing.